How's it going? Welcome to another video. So here's an interesting thing. We're going to talk about real estate today. And I want to start off by asking you guys, you know, what do you think is more important right now? For those who don't have a lot of money, all right, is it important to start thinking about home ownership, even though you don't have a lot of cash put away, uh, just so that you can start getting into your home and start worrying about not paying rent anymore and basically paying down that mortgage? Or do you think it's a good idea to still continue to rent, save up a little money, and then think about home ownership down the road? What do you guys think the answer to that is, right? So I'm gonna let you guys figure that out. But in the meantime, let's start with this video, okay? So the reason for my topic being real estate today is because a lot of individuals have asked me lately, Ali, I need some direction. I don't know what to do. I wanna start getting into a home and here's my rent right now, right? I don't have a lot of money stacked away. And I'm thinking, are there any opportunities where I can go into 100% financing or whatever it is uh, that's the amount of the mortgage is comparable to that amount of whatever I pay in terms of rent. And even if it's slightly higher, I'm willing to pay it. You know, that's usually what I get approached with. And before I get into the home ownership situation, uh, I want to break down, you know, what, I, what ended up happening in 2008, the housing crisis, right? And the housing crisis, the way it worked is, so let's say you have a lot of people and we're going to draw these people. And excuse my drawing, not the best, okay? But I try. So you got these little individuals, right? That come in and then you had these conglomerates, which are banks, right? So you have banks and they're private. And these are not FDIC insured financial institutions, right? And what they were doing is they were giving out mortgages to individuals at that time. And these were, you know, B rated mortgages, C rated mortgages, triple Bs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the reason of this type of rating is based on payments the payment history of customers, right? So you have industries such as um, Fitz and Moody's, which are rating agencies. And I'm gonna give you a breakdown of that, right? So individuals borrow from these private institutions who are generally rated B plus, B, B, uh, C plus. And they give money to these individuals to go and buy a home for 100% financing, okay? So these individuals were able to get house for 100% financing. And during that time, right, what happened was applications were not really looked at thoroughly. There was a lot of information that was missing uh, to the point so that a lot of individuals who actually got homes in that period in 2008 uh, didn't even qualify, didn't even have jobs. You know, documents and underwriting were basically blindfolds on and keep giving out money, right, make it rain. So during that process, what ends up happening is now this person's highly motivated, right? So they know like applications are not really looked at. These mortgage brokers in between these intermediaries, they don't even care, right, to, to look at that. So they used to tell, you know, these type of people who are gullible and who are really looking forward to owning homes that, hey, you can actually buy one or two more, right? Because we're not really looking at this criteria. Everybody's giving out money. It's an opportunity. These house prices are going to go up. You can refinance. All these beautiful things are going to happen. And at that time, these intermediaries and mortgage brokers, you know, for them, what it is, it's, it's paper, right? It's, it's money, right? So when they actually give out mortgages more than one, they're the same people. The same people would bring in their friends, families, etc., and they would get more money. So they would get more houses, right? And they would buy like one, two, three, four, five. They buy a lot of houses. And what they would do by getting these type of houses was that they would start renting it out, All right? So they would start renting it out uh, and, and they would start making a little bit of cash here and there. And because of the fact that it's 100% financing, the mortgage is so high, they wouldn't make a lot of cash. Sometimes they'd even go negative. So they'd have to put it out of their own pocket to sustain these homes. And keep in mind, Okay, because it was so easy to come by, now renters wouldn't even care about renting anymore. So what they would do is they themselves would turn into a customer and get a new house uh, for 100% financing. So what ends up happening is you have this vicious cycle that would come full circle and it caused a lot of damage. And what ends up happening, these, these renters now owned homes all of a sudden. So these people who own homes who are looking to rent it out don't have customers, right? And it didn't happen overnight, of course. We, we know this, right? So these mortgage brokers, they're done with you. They made their money. 
you're stuck with a few properties at 100% financing. You're putting it out of your own pocket. And you're holding on to hopes that the price value of the house will go up. And you're hoping also at the same time that you get some cash flow from the tenants in your properties. But unfortunately, what ends up happening is the same tenants kind of got wind of 100% financing. There's a lot of marketing that happened, a lot of advertising and television, radio, uh, you know, magazines, and so on and so forth. So they actually got wind of what you're doing. And now they themselves want to turn into customers who own homes. So they can do the same thing you're doing. So what ended up happening is this vicious cycle, like I explained, right? So a lot of people started getting into home ownership with 100% financing. And they got sucked into this notion that the house prices will go up. The assets will appreciate. They'll make a lot of money. They'll rent it out. They'll make cash flow. They'll be the next you know, Warren Buffet or Robert Kiyosaki. And... They'll be the next Donald Trump and they'll be they'll own a real estate empire and it'll be a real estate mogul, right? But we know the truth. And the reason why they were rated Bs, and now we're, we're going to talk about ratings, okay? So, so far I explained to you, you get 100% financing. These mortgage brokers pushed a lot of mortgages on vulnerable customers who gave them the false hope. And eventually what ended up happening was those individuals were misled. They bought a lot of homes hoping that people would rent it out. The same people who they were renting it out to came, got wind of the strategy that you're using, and then they want it to become homeowners as well. And then it's just a bit vicious cycle. And then all of a sudden you have a lot of baggage that you have to cover, right? All of a sudden you have two to three empty homes that you have to cover the rent yourself. You have to pay the mortgage companies. And then you start starting missing some payments. You start you know, going in uh, you know, 30 days late, 60 days, 90 days, et cetera, et cetera. And foreclosures would happen after like a year or two, whatever, right? But because it's expensive and it's hurting your credit at the same time, what ends up happening is these institutions, Moody's, right? It's called Moody's, you had Fitch, among others, right? These institutions, what they are essentially is, they look at a portfolio of mortgages. And let's say these bad debts, you know, they look at that portfolio, they look at how it's uh, classified. What are some of the payments in that portfolio? How are people performing? Are the payments being met on time? Uh, is the debt secure? Because the reason why they want to rate that portfolio is because they're going to sell that portfolio to foreign investors and to what we call CDOs. CDOs are essentially collateralized debt obligations. Okay, so CDOs are collateralized debt obligations. These are houses that are collateralized and it's an obligation of debt. And because there's hundreds of them or thousands of them into one financing institution or umbrella, what they can do is they can get those umbrellas rated through an agency like Moody's or Fitch and give it a rating, like a B plus. You know, B plus is less risky, you know, payments are here and there, I mean, a double B is like, okay, a little bit more risky. You have C, which is, you know, higher risk, but the payments are even more. Uh, so they would rate it, and then the purpose of that rating would be to offer investors a rate of return by simply purchasing this entire portfolio from these guys. That's, that's where the investment banking channel comes in, right? So hundreds of billions of dollars of portfolios were rated and all of a sudden, what the rating agencies would do would give advice to these investment bankers and say, look, if you want to make more money on your portfolio and sell it to foreign investors, why don't you mix these portfolios? And then we'll get a, give it an A, or A plus or double A. So basically, they're manipulating the way the mortgages were structured, the way they, they were being put to, together in that portfolio. All right. If you haven't watched the movie, uh, you know, The Big Short, that's a good movie. Uh, Steve Carroll was on it, and it's actually a very interesting movie that talks a little bit about this as well. Uh, we had, you know, foreign banks like Deutsche Bank, Barclays, all those big boys from Europe got involved in this whole mess, and of course, the calamity of the housing market crisis happened. Uh, but let's go back into this, right? So these rating agencies would give advice to these investment banks, and these investment banks would follow lead and uh, come to these guys and say, "Look, uh, we're going to bring you business. Can you help us with the ratings?" And somewhat manipulation happened, right? So you have these A's and double A's. But in actuality, there's, let's say, C's or a good amount of it are good tranches of double B's or whatever. And tranches are essentially packages of like bad mortgages stuck into this big portfolio. Uh, who has the unanimous A rating, right? The big one. So that ended up happening. And eventually what happened was investors got wind. Oh, yeah, I'm buying this portfolio, but I'm not getting my payments on time. It's defaulting and what's going on. And then all of a sudden, all these guys started knocking down. And of course, behind the scenes, insurance companies created this thing called, uh, you know, quantitative easing through process of derivatives. Derivatives are essentially insurance products like betting against the market, betting that this thing won't perform. And if the bet wins, 
you get a good payout. Let's say a 1 to 20 ratio. I bet you for a dollar to make $20 if this crashes. And because a lot of people in the financial particularly the investment banks and retail banks, had confidence in their own housing and the way that they were performing. And because they were so misled because of the way the ratings were working, uh, they would hold up that bet. So when that happened, those guys who were intelligent enough to bet against the housing market by analyzing the cash flow statements and looking into the financials made a lot of money. Okay, so that's where uh, these CDOs, you know, came out to be collateralized debt obligations and stuff like that. So when that happened, they had a synthetic CDO. A synthetic CDO, which is a fake version of this whole thing, which is the same as equivalent as a bet, is basically, if this fails, I get the, this type of payout. That's what a synthetic collateral is, that obligation. It's basically a bet, okay? So this whole thing happened in 2008, basically took wind of everybody, wiped a lot of people off, put a lot of people on the streets, a lot of people became homeless. A lot of people lost their homes, of course, because of the vicious cycle we just explained. And a disaster happened like no other in the United States of America in that time, right? So this is what happened in the housing market crisis. This is the whole picture. Now you guys start seeing it, right? So I'm going to give you one more overview. So you had these mortgage companies, private, and you had these mortgage brokers. We'll put them here as Bs. And they were selling mortgages to regular individuals who didn't have the ticket, you know, down payment, et cetera, et cetera, excuse me. And what ended up happening was they usually, you know, they know that, you know, underwriting is going to be very strict, et cetera, et cetera. But they started blindfoldly underwriting all these type of mortgages, giving people more than one home, uh, two to three homes. They wouldn't even look for job qualifications or anything like that. And they used to get one or two homes, three, four, five homes. And all of a sudden, the tenants that they were having who were renting out their properties got wind of what's happening here and they themselves wanted a piece of the pie they wanted a piece of wealth so they went out there and asked for mortgages and of course because the qualification factors were not as severe they themselves got approved for homes as well and it became a vicious cycle of trying to rent it out and trying to own it and hold on to it until equity happens and what ended up happening is as these are being built you have rating agencies like moody's and fitch who service investment banks who look at portfolios of these type of mortgages and give them a rating so that they can be sold on the market first uh, and of course give an interest rate uh, you know falsified the ratings because they took the bad ones and they added a bunch of good ones and then all of a sudden it's diversified so it's less risky so they gave it an a rating so they manipulated the system and those who were intelligent enough uh, you know created this derivative product which is a betting product called the synthetic cdo synthetic cdo is basically a collateralized debt obligation against the housing market it's a bet so it's a 1 to 20 sometimes 1 to 200 whatever uh, that if this goes down if this portfolio defaults i get this type of payout so a lot of banks agreed to it because they knew they had such confidence in their ratings that this would never happen it's free money to maintain a synthetic cdo the bet you have to pay premiums every month it's like an insurance policy so banks were like hey we're making free premiums let's give them these policies we know it's never going to happen where housing market is going to be perfect and what ended up happening was everything came crashing down. Everything came crashing down. A lot of people lost their homes. You want to hear something funny? Dogs were getting mortgages. People wouldn't even look at who the person was or their IDs. Dogs, puppies were getting mortgages. You know, you know, mortgages, if you look it up, some of the names during the investigation process by the SEC and all these major agencies, you had individuals who had names. And when they looked up those names, they're asking that person, who is this G Jimmy? Oh, Jimmy's my dog. No, okay, so how come this dog has a mortgage? Well, I don't know. The mortgage guy said it's okay, right? So that's something that you know a lot of people went through. So the question here is, and I know it's a long answer, but the question here is, should you have a mortgage with 100% 100 finance, 100 financing? And the truth to that is not yet. Okay, unless you have significant cash put away and you're just doing it for the sake of leveraging your credit to obtain financing and you know you can afford it, and you know there's a bigger picture. You know that that marketplace that you're in has a high chance of appreciation in the next few years. And all you're simply doing is you're taking a risk to appreciate that. You know you're not going to be short on cash. That property is going to actually rent for more than what you're paying in terms of mortgage. In a scenario like that, and you have high confidence in that marketplace, and you have a lot of cash stored away, at least two years of mortgage payments, then 100% financing is a beautiful thing. 
But unless you're in that situation where it's very unique and there's appreciation happening and you have cash stored away and there's tenants that are willing to pay more than what the mortgage is because the comps in that area in terms of rent is actually greater than what you're actually charging and you have opportunity to increase that as well uh, at value, that's something that you can do 100% financing for. But if you're not aiming for that direction, I strongly advise you to stay away from 100% financing. And the reason I say that is because we just explored what happened in 2008. Okay, I'm not saying that you know uh, the regulators are not gonna kind of put a leash on this whole process, and they still are, and they're still investigating till date some of these guys. Uh, but what what's happening here is you have to ask yourself: Is it worth the risk to lose a home, damage your credit, and be financially handicapped for the next few years just because you can wait until you get a home? Is it worth it for you? You know, and I always educate my customers that you have to understand. Okay. The credit is your cornerstone. It's the thing that'll help you build wealth. Why don't you use it for something good? Like being a guarantor for an individual who's Fannie and Freddie maxed out. They have a lot of properties. They want to get into it, but they can't because of their limitations and financing. But they have the portfolio. They have good performance. And helping them access a portfolio of mortgages in addition to what they have is a good strategic partnership area. Maybe that's what you want to use your credit for instead of 100% financing. Build the cash from that that type of strategic partnership and then bring it down and buy your own home or go into further real estate investing. But don't get in a rush, all right, to buy a home for 100% financing. It's gonna give you, it's gonna paralyze you if you're not doing it right. It's gonna hurt, right? Can you imagine, I'm gonna ask you this question. Can you imagine going into a house, you bring your kids in, everybody's having a great time and all of a sudden, God forbid, you lose your job. And then all of a sudden you can't make those payments anymore because you don't have the two years of money saved away for the mortgage, right? You don't have cash reserves because if you did, you wouldn't worry about 100% financing unless we discussed that alternative strategy at the beginning. And now all of a sudden, you have to look at your kids and your wife or your husband in the face and say, look, we have to move back to an apartment. We have to downsize. We can't have that backyard or the, the swings or the toys. No, we can't have that driveway for our car. It's very painful. And I've witnessed that because I had the business of loan modification in 2007 and 8, and I did a lot of credit work in that, and I did work with investment banks on a very large level. But I know the pain that people go through. I know how devastating it is. Okay, so I'll ever do everything I can in terms of my educational power and content to advise all those individuals that are getting into home ownership to be very careful because I know how painful that is. The painstaking journey that individuals have to go through to preserve their dignity. Okay. So is it worth it to get 100% financing? Not so much. Unless I said there's an appreciation in that marketplace. You have cash stored away for 12, you know, two years of uh, mortgage payments. And you know you can get rent for more than your mortgage with decent cash flow. Because the comp in that area for rental is a lot higher than what you're going to be charging. Okay, And you'll be comfortable. Because you'll be lower rent. People are going to come to you. And the house is nice. You get 100% financing. There's appreciation that happens. But you don't bank on that. You have money saved aside as well. So that's the strategy I would recommend. Okay, If you're looking for 100% financing, don't. Unless those conditions are met. And if you don't have that opportunity to invest in real estate, pay the rent you're paying now, but try to put money aside. All right, well, We can talk about real estate partnerships and all these type of situations in the future where you can join with a group of individuals like yourself to create a small portion of something that's so big that we can do that and get into real estate the right way and diversify your risk so you don't take all the craziness on yourself, okay? And of course, we're gonna go after teams that are experienced and that do the right thing. We're gonna talk about that in the next episode. But for the time being, I want you to pay close attention to what I just said, because I care about you guys. I want you to really pay attention to what happened, what happened in 2008. Do your own independent research, but you'll get the flow of why a lot of people lost their homes, okay? We don't wanna make that mistake. Even though it's very addictive to look at 100% financing mortgages and all these type of things, we want to stay away from that kind of risk. It's not worth it for us, okay? So with that said and done, my friends, this is after your guide and mentor. And um, before I go, if you like the content that I share with you, give me a thumbs up. Tell me what you learned today. You know, comment below. Are you in a situation where you have to get 100% financing? Are you in a rush to get a home? If so, let me know below. I'll answer you guys. And don't forget to share this video if you found it helpful and, of course, interesting. Uh, there's a newsletter, sign up below, and I'll see you guys on the other side, okay? I'll lead to Rafter once again, your guide and mentor. Bye for now.